Okay, so good morning once again. E, just to repeat what I said earlier, e, the first part of what we are going to do is for me to give a summary of what we discussed in class e, in the previous week. And after that, we look at the uh, unit root tests in EVUs. So that is what we are going to do. And uh, in what we did in the in our previous lecture, I started off by explaining um, the fact that most of the variables that we use in economics have some trends. And I said that if a variable is a trend, it is, it is said to have a unit root. So if a variable has a trend, it is said to have a unit root. And such a variable cannot be used when doing estimations using the ordinary least squares, because the results that you end up getting will be nonsensical. For example, if, if you have two, variables with the trends, for example, GDP and consumption. If you are trying to regress consumption and GDP, where GDP is your dependent variable and consumption is your independent variable, if both of them have trends, it means the results that you get from such an estimation are nonsensical. So that is what we talked about first in our previous lecture. So this is just to give you a, what the grammatic depiction of what I'm saying. So this is the variable on the vertical axis over time, being measured over time. And if the variables is behaving this way, Right. If this is the what the trend diagram for the for the for the for the variable, then we say it is an upward trend. It is increasing over time. So in such a case, the variable in, does not have a constant mean, and it also doesn't have a constant variance, because. The actual observations around this uh, line could be something that I'm adding now, where if you join all these points, you will have a line that zigzags uh, about this line that you have drawn, something like this. So as you can see, if you were to calculate the mean, you will have a mean that increases over time. And if we also to calculate the variance associated with these individual points that allows you to draw this zigzag line, it means the variance is also not constant, but is increasing over time. This is what we said, what we called the mean and the variance are time variant, meaning that they change over time. The mean and the variance are time variant, which means they change over time. So if a variable is a trend, its mean and variance are time variant, right? They are time variant, meaning that they change over time. So we said for variables that behave this way, they cannot be used in a regression equation. However, if you have a variable, say that, behaves in this manner where this is the mean and then the oscillations about the mean are uniform like this, right? Are uniform like this. In this case, if this is your variable over time, it means the mean of this variable is constant. The mean is constant in this diagram. And the variance is also constant because the amplitudes of uh, the observations about the mean are more or less the same above and below the, the mean. 
So in this case, you can say there is constant mean and constant variance, right? There is constant mean and constant variance. So if he, the two variables that you want to use in your regression equation, you have constant mean and constant variance. It means that you can use those variables in your regression equation and get some good results. So that is what we said. And in this case, we can say that the variable is a constant mean and constant variance, right? Constant mean and constant variance. And we can also say it is constant covariance. So this is what we discussed the last time. In <clears throat> So just to summarize some of the things we, we, we did. So we said the for a variable to be said to be stationary. So we said the expected value of the variable, if it is yt, the expected value of the variable is equal to a, a constant mean. A constant mean. I'm using mu for that. Then we also said the variance, the variance of yt, the variance of yt, which is our variable, is equal to the, the what? Expected value of expected value of yt of yt. A minus the mean, which is mu a squared. And this should be equal to sigma squared, where this is the variance. So we are saying the, vari the, the variable is constant mean, and the variable is a variance which is constant, and the, also the covariance, the covariance the covariance is given by expected value of in y t minus mean in y t minus k. You can use minus k or plus k is the same thing. The result you get is the same, a minus a mean, a, where you have a, a bigger bracket and squared. So what we say is a time series is stationary if it's mean, variance, and auto covariance at various lags remain the same no matter at what point we measure it, right? Remain the same no matter at what point we measure it. So just like the diagram that I just erased, the one which was like this. So if our diagram is like this, we are seeing our variance and the mean remain the same no matter at what lag or time that we are measuring it it remains the same. So the variance remains the same over time, and the mean also remains the same over time. That is what we mean by that statement. So a time series is stationary. If it's mean, variance, and autocovariance at various lags remain the same no matter at what point we measure them. So this is what we, 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 we said. Are the, these are the properties that are associated with variables that are stationary. If a variable is stationary, it must have all these three properties. It must have a constant mean, it must have a constant variance, and also a constant auto covariance. So that is what we, we, we said are the properties of the, in the what? <clears throat> of variables that are stationary. Then the, the other thing that we discussed is that we discussed the formal tests 
for measuring uh, the formal test for measuring uh, unit truth. And there are three formal tests that we discussed, right? We discussed the Dick Fuller test, the augmented Dick Fuller test, and the Phillips Peron test. So those are the three tests that we discussed. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to summarize uh, the test equations associated with the Dick Fuller test, the hypothesis, and this decision rule and then go to the next one and the next one. I'm sure I need uh, something like 20 minutes to do that. So the, the diagram, diagrammatic representation, which I showed you earlier, where I drew the variable y uh, over time, we can take it as an informal method of measuring non-stationarity, of measuring unit truth. So if you draw a diagram which shows the trend of your y variable over time, that is an informal way of telling whether the variable is a unit truth or not. Because we said that if the variable is trending upwards or downwards, then we say it is a unit truth. That is what we, we, we said. We say so, you can actually tell that the variable is a unit root even before you conduct some formal tests uh, for unit roots. So that is the point I'm trying to, 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 to drive home. So having said that, let's now look at the formal tests for, for unit roots. And I said, the first formal test that we discussed last time is the Dickey Fuller test, the Dickey Fuller test the DF test. And the, I said the DF test has three equations. And if you still remember, for us to derive the Dickey-Fuller test equations, we started off with a random, random walk uh, equation. And using the random walk equation, we subtracted y t minus one from both sides of the equation. And that is what gave us what we called the Dickey Fuller test equations. So I'm just going to write the three Dickey Fuller test equations here. So the first Dickey Fuller test equation that we discussed is the one given by a change in yt is equal to a sigma a yt minus one, yt minus one plus a white noise error term, white noise error term, right? So white noise, meaning that we expect this to have zero mean and constant variance. That's the white noise, that we, what we refer to as the white noise error term. It, it should have those properties, that it must have zero mean and constant variance. And we said this equation is being tested without constant and without trend. And we say we are testing it at none. That is what I said. When you are in if use, you are testing it none. Then the second equation is given by yt, change in yt is equal to a constant which we can denote by an alpha plus a sigma yt minus one plus a white noise error term, white noise error term. And you are testing this at, um, this is a model with a constant, right? So this model is a constant. So the model we are testing is a constant. Then the third equation that we discussed associated with the Dickey Fuller test is yt is equal to the constant plus a, the trend with the coefficient. This is the trend variable t plus 
the sigma yt, yt minus one, yt minus one plus yt noise eratium, yt noise eratium. And here we are testing at constant and trend. We're testing a module with a constant and a trend. So the first one did not have the constant and trend. The second one had a constant, and the third one is both constant and trend. So these are the three test equations that you use when using the Tikifla test. When using the Tikifla test. And the, we said that the now hypothesis for this test is given by the now hypothesis, we say it is given by sigma being equal to zero. And the alternative hypothesis is given by sigma, sigma being less than zero, being less than zero. And we said the decision rule, your decision rule is that if the p value that you get in, for the sigma, if the t value that you get <clears throat> is for the test, for the test statistic, if the p value you get is smaller than 5%, you reject the now hypothesis and conclude that the variable is stationary. So if the p-value is smaller than 5%, the variable is stationary in levels. And if the p-value is greater than 5%, then the variable is non-stationary in levels, right? The variable is non-stationary. So that is what we we discussed, right? That is what we discussed. Then the other thing that I can say is if the calculated test statistic is more negative than the critical values, if the calculated test statistic is more negative than the critical values, then the the variable is stationary. The variable is stationary. That is another way of putting it. The variable is stationary. And the, we also wrote this hypothesis in words. We also wrote this hypothesis in words where we said H0 simply means that the variable is a unit root the variable is a unit root, or we are saying the variable is non-stationary. That's the now hypothesis. It simply says the variable is a unit root, or the variable is non-stationary, right? So that is how we put it. Then the, the alternative hypothesis is the variable does not have a unit root, or the variable is stationary. So those are the uh, other ways in which you can represent the, 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 the these hypotheses. So if there are no questions, I move on. So the second set of test equations that we discussed was the augmented dick flood test. And I said the augmented Dick-Fuller test was developed because of the problems that are associated with uh, the Dick-Fuller test, augmented Dick-Fuller test. And I said the problems that the Dick-Fuller test can have is that sometimes it suffers from autocorrelation, right? It suffers from autocorrelation. And this is the reason why the augmented Dick Fuller test was developed. It was developed in order to resolve the problem, the problem of autocorrelation that the Dick Fuller test sometimes 
sometimes have. So I said that the augmented Dickey-Fuller test equations include Sorry, sir. Many is possible to ensure that there is no autocorrelation in the variable. Was that a question? Yes, this is a question, Prof. Uh, Sunday. Um, I just want to verify, what does it mean when, um, when uh, the variables have autocorrelation? You are saying, what does it mean? When we say a yeah. variable is autocorrelation. From autocorrelation. Okay, I think I tried to explain this in the very first lecture, where I said when a variable is said to experience a suffer from autocorrelation, it means that a It means that the errors that we get from the variable are related. In other words, the current error, current error is explained by the previous errors, right? And the, this is what I mean. You may have an equation like this one where the residual or the error term the residual or the error term in the in the in the current period, the residual for the current period is explained by the residuals in the previous period. You may have a constant, then you may have a, a what of a one et et minus one plus a of a two et et minus two plus up to uh, depending on the number of flux that explain the current error term plus the uh, alpha n uh, et et minus n uh, plus some other form of error term. So if the current errors that we get from a variable are explained by the previous errors, that is what leads to the problem of autocorrelation. And the, just to illustrate, in case you, you, you have forgotten, if this is the trend line or the or the line that represents the what the, the, the mean of a variable where this is the y variable and this is the uh, the what the over time we are saying the observations about this mean can be this one it can be somewhere there it can also be somewhere there these are the individual observations and the, using these observations, we were able to fit this line of best fit. So what I'm calling this trend line is the line of best fit. That's how you described it in your undergrad econometrics. So this is an individual observation in your data set. And we are saying, if you drop a line up to this a line of best fit, the gap between this point and that is what I'm calling an error. This is an error, one error. And the gap between this line and this other point is another error, right? This is an error. Then this is another error, uh, an E3, another error, this one. So the gaps between the individual observations and the line of best fit gives you what I'm referring to as the errors. And I'm saying, if the current error for the 2023 or 2024 observation is being explained by the previous errors from the previous observations for the previous years, then we have autocorrelation. So that is what we mean by autocorrelation. 
right? So if you attended the first lecture that we had, we talked about the error-based diagnostic tests or the residual-based diagnostic tests. And under those residual-based diagnostic tests, we had autocorrelation, where we had the hypothesis that the errors from the estimated model are not autocorrelated. That was the now hypothesis. And the alternative hypothesis was the errors are autocorrelated. That is what we, 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 we did. If first, then we also talked about another error based test, heteroscedasticity, where we said the errors from the estimated model are homoscedastic, is our now hypothesis. And the alternative being that the errors from the estimated model are heteroscedastic. And the, you must pay particular attention to the way I am uh, explaining these hypotheses. So these are diagnostic tests based on residuals. Then the third one that we discussed was normality, where we said the errors from the estimated regression equation are normally distributed is our now hypothesis. And the alternative was that the errors from the estimated regression equation uh, was uh, not normally distributed. So those are the error-based uh, tests that we, we discussed. And another error-based test, which is a stability test, was the RAMS research test. Was the RAMS research test give us information about whether the model that we have specified is correctly specified. So that's another error-based test that we discussed, okay? I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you, sir, for summarizing. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we are looking at the augmented degree test. And I was explaining the fact that the augmented Dickfuller test was developed because of the challenges that were being experienced with the use of the first test that was developed, the Dickfuller test. So it had been discovered that the Dickfuller test was giving the problem of autocorrelation. So that's why this ADF was developed to resolve the problem of autocorrelation. And from the explanation I gave in the previous lecture, the augmented Dickfuller test includes lags that are enough to ensure that the variable does not suffer from autocorrelation. So you include as many lags as you can to ensure that the variable does not suffer from autocorrelation. So the way we wrote our augmented Dickfuller test equations is as follows. We are the the first test equation, the first test, the uh, augmented Dickfuller test equation uh, being given by a uh, sigma yt, yt minus one plus summation of uh, where we have j is equal to one up to n. A beta j change in y t minus j plus a white noise error 10. White noise error 10. So this is the augmented Dickfuller equation at none where there is no constant and no trend. And the, this component here, this component of the equation is the one that is including the lags of the equation 
that are enough to ensure that there is no autocorrelation in this variable y. So these are the lags of the variable that are included to ensure that there is no autocorrelation in this uh, variable. Then we also talked about the uh, equation that tests for a df at by using a constant, so the model with a constant. So let's do that. The model with a constant is something like this. Is equal to. So you need the constant, which I can I can use alpha for that. Plus, then the rest of the stuff is just is above, plus sigma. E y, t, minus one. Plus. The, the lags n j is equal to one A beta j change in y t minus j plus the white noise error term white noise error term. So this is the model it con when the model with a constant constant. So this is the second augmented degree fuller equation. And the third equation that we discussed is the one with constant and trend. The one with constant and trend, which is given by the alpha plus the trend variable, the trend variable. Oh, I'm using B, let me not use B, because I've also, I've used it somewhere. So let me use the alpha one. You can call this alpha zero, this alpha one, plus the sigma yt minus one, plus the what? The lags j is equal to a one beta j beta j change in yt minus j plus white noise error term. So this is the model with constant and trend, model with constant and trend, right? So these are our three augmented degree fuller test equations. And the, once again, the now hypothesis is the same as the one that we had for the degree fuller equation, where we say it H0, uh, our now hypothesis, uh, sigma is equal to zero. And the alternative hypothesis is that a sigma is less than zero. And the decision rule is that if a, the calculated t statistic for this test is more negative than the critical values, then a, the variable is stationary. Or alternatively, if the p-value that you get is less than 5%, then the variable is stationary. If the p-value is greater than 5%, the variable is non-stationary in levels at that level you are measuring. So those are the decision rules that you can come up with with regards to the augmented degree fuller test. So it's the same as what we did with the degree fuller test. Now let's look at quickly look at the last test, which is the what the Phillips Perron test. The Phillips Perron test. I said that the equations, the test equations for the Phillips Perron test are the same as the test equations for the degree fuller test. Right? But there is a, a lot more 
that happens when testing, when using the Phillips Peron test, because I said that the Phillips Peron test is based on parametric tests. And the, the parameters in the Phillips Peron test are calculated by using some com complicated formula, some com complicated formula. We don't do that manually, but it's something that if used can do in the background. And those complicated formula, non-parametric test formulas that are used by if use help in resolving the problems of both autocorrelation and heteroscedasticity in the variables. So we said the augmented Dickey-Fuller test it only deals with the what the problem of serial correlation, uh, which may be available in the Dickey-Fuller test. But in the case of the Phillips Peron, it resolves the problems of heteroscedasticity and auto autocorrelation, which may be available in the vari variables. So what it means is that the Phillips Peron test is actually an advanced test as compared to both the Dickey Fuller and the augmented Dickey Fuller test. Right. So when you write the equations for the Phillips Peron, they are just the same as those for the Dickey Fuller, where we said a change in yt, if our variable is yt, change in yt is equal to a what? A sigma yt minus one minus one plus a white noise error term. So this is how we 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 wrote the what the equation without constant and trend for the Dickey Fuller test. So it's this very same equation we use for the Phillips Peron test. So the other equation was yt change in yt is equal to a, a constant plus a, our sigma yt minus one, minus one plus a white noise error term, white noise error term. And the third equation is yt, just like we did with the Dickey Fuller, alpha plus a alpha one t plus a, a sigma yt minus one, plus a white noise error term. So this is the equation without constant and trend. This is the equation with constant or the model with constant. This is the model with constant and trend. So just to reiterate what I said, the Phillips Perron test this is the Phillips, the PP test. That's how you abbreviate it, is the PP test. The Phillips Peron test is based on non-parametric tests. And the, the non-parametric tests of the parameters of the PP test help in resolving the problem, the problems of autocorrelation and the truth that assist. And the, those non-parametric tests are based on some complicated formulae, which most of the software that we use uh, in econometrics are able to compute, right? So most softwares that we use, like uh, if use PC give Stata uh, and others, they are able to uh, do those computations in the background and give parameters that are free from and give what uh, results that are free from heteroscedasticity and and the and autocorrelation. So this is what we did in our previous lecture. And the, this is just a summary of what we did. And for the full set of notes, I have now uploaded the notes uh, on e-learning. And there are two sets of notes that I uploaded. You are supposed to know both those sets of notes. You are supposed to know both of them. So that is what we did the last time.
And the, what do I expect you to know with regards to all this? You must be able to specify the three Dicke Fuller test equations. You must be able to write them. If I give you the variable y, you must be able to write the three Dicke Fuller test equations. You must also be able to specify the hypothesis that you are testing, and you must be familiar with the decision rule associated with uh, those tests. Then uh, you must also be able to specify the augmented Dicke Fuller test equations, do the hypothesis testing, and uh, make a decision uh, on the results that you have found, right? Same applies with the Phillips Perron test. You must know the three test equations. So if you know the Dicke Fuller test equations, you also know the Phillips Perron test equations because they are the same. The only difference is that is the way in which they are measured when we are using the softwares that we use to measure them. The Phillips Perron test is a non-parametric type of test, but the Dicke Fuller test is not a non-parametric type of test. So you are supposed to know all these test equations by heart, because I don't provide the formulas when, 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 when in test situations, you are supposed to know this stuff by heart. And I'm sure you can see there is a pattern in the way we've been writing them, and it's easy to remember these things. It's easy for you to remember them. In, I don't I don't know how you 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 study, but uh, it's very easy to remember this stuff that we've been, we've just been looking at. Was he, you just read the stuff, then close the book, just try to remember what you have read. That's it. You can remember everything without any difficulty. I don't know how you 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 you, you do your studies, but uh, that is a method that I use which works for me. If I want to remember something, I just look at it for a few minutes, then close the book, try to remember it, that's it. If I can remember it, then it sticks in my head. So I, I, I hope that you that is what you will do in order to remember these things. Then the other thing that we talked about last time is what I called the order of integration. I talked about the order of integration. And I said the order of integration refers to the number of times you need to difference a variable for it to become stationary. So the order of integration, let me type it here, order of integration, of integration. I'm saying is the number the number of times you difference the variable for it to become stationary, become stationary, right? The number of times you difference a variable for it to become stationary. For example, if you need to difference a variable once for it to become stationary, then we say it is integrated of order one. If the variable is stationary in levels, if the variable is stationary in levels, it means you don't need to difference it to become stationary. It's already stationary in levels. So there's no difference that is required. And we call that variable integrated of order one. So what we are saying is that the number of times you need to difference a variable to become stationary. In other words, the number of times you need to difference a variable so that its mean, its variance, and covariance are constant over time. So the number of times that you have to difference a variable so that its properties are that and such that its mean, its variance, and its covariance are 
constant over time. Just the way I described it earlier. So we can talk about in integration of order one, integration of order zero, integration of order zero. And this is how we write it formally. When you want to write, write that the variable is integrated of order zero, in other words, you don't need to difference this variable for it to become stationary. It's already stationary. This is how you write it. It's integrated of order zero. So a variable that is integrated of order zero is already stationary. And you don't need to difference it to become stationary. It's already stationary. So let's say you've collected your data for inflation. And then you test for its order of integration and find that it's integrated of order zero. It means that data that you've collected for inflation does not need to be different to become stationary. You don't need to change it in any way for it to become stationary. It's already stationary. So that type of data is the data that we call is integrated of order zero, right? So this is, we say the, the, the what? The, the variable, the variable, the variable, is stationary, is stationary, stationary. And you must take note of the spelling stationary, not stationary like the stationary, uh, which refers to books and other things. Stationary, yes. <laughs> then if a variable needs to be different once to become stationary, we say it is integrated of order one. It's integrated of order one. And this is how you write that. In this case, the variable needs to be differenced once to become stationary. It has to be differenced once to become stationary. You have to difference it once for it to have a constant mean, a constant variance, and a constant covariance. You have to difference it once for it to achieve those properties. Okay? Then he, if a variable needs to be difference twice to become stationary or to achieve those properties, then you write it in this manner. It means you need to difference the variable twice for it to become stationary. That is for it to have a constant mean, constant variance, and constant covariance. So you need to difference it twice. And in what we did previously, I said that the only variables that may have an order of integration of two is a variable like the wages, wages. That's the variable and prices. Sometimes may have an integration of order two, right? Those are the two variables that may actually give you an order of integration like that. All the other macroeconomic variables that you can think of, the GDPs, the exports, investment, government spending, consumption, and so on and so forth. All the other variables are supposed to be integrated of order one or integrated of order zero. All the other variables are integrated of order one and integrated of order zero. Only prices and wages could we have an order of integration of two. Then he, he, Then the, the to generalize to generalize what, what 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 we are doing to generalize a variable can have an order of integration of order d can have an integration of order d. This is how you read it. The variable is integrated of order d. What that means is we need to difference this variable d times for it to become stationary. You need to, to difference the variable d times for it to become stationary. That is for it to have a constant mean, constant variance, and constant covariance. So I think that brings us to the end of what we discussed the last time. Now we need to move on to what? the practical uh, lecture.
uh, the practical lecture where we discuss how we use these three methods that we have just discussed. And if you have questions, please ask. All right. <clears throat> so I will stop this share and the, now share my e-views. E-views. Uh, before we do this, let me find out how many of you were able to download eViews 12 and install it on their computers using the steps that I described to you? from someone how many of you have uh -huh. downloaded if used 12 and installed it on their computers um sir you so succeeded I tried, I tried downloading it but then that day uh, i saw that it didn't ask for the information for my information so then it's just it's like uh, yeah i don't know i couldn't succeed with it but I, I'll try again today. Uh, let me even try now. But yeah, it didn't ask for my information, and I think that is the reason. I don't know if it's. Yeah, I think the, 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 the problem is the, that lecture that we had, where I wasn't showing you what you were supposed to see on my screen as I was explaining. I think that is where the problem is. But I'm sure if you listen carefully to that lecture, you will be able to install it. But then, if you, if you are still having problems, I think I can repeat the explanation in our next lecture. I can repeat the explanation in our next lecture so that you, 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 you can install. I think our next lecture is on Monday. So I can repeat that explanation in our next lecture in, in class. So that... The, you can install the if use and start practicing. The other thing that I yes. try to explain to you is that each and every one of you is supposed to have a computer. You are supposed to have a computer where you install your if use, your if use and practice these things. Because practice makes perfect. You need to do it yourself. Okay? So that's my advice to you if you haven't tried downloading it, please do so as soon as possible because this is important. Right, so can you see the screen I'm sharing? Yes, sir. All right. So we are just going back to the work file that we were using in the previous lecture. This one, 2024 practice work file, the first one. So I will go there. And the the file still is a summary of the things that we did in the previous lecture. Okay. So, um, let me remove what we did so that we remain with the data only. <laughs> we remain with the data only. All right, so we have our variables, GDP, a dividend, FTI, inflation, PCE, and PDI. So those are the variables that we used. Now, I told you earlier that the first test that you can do is an informal test. If you want to find out if variables, if your variables are stationary or non-stationary. And I said, if your variables have trends, it means they are non-stationary. And if they do not have trends, they are non, they are, they, they are stationary. Okay. So let's let, let, let's do what we did previously. I will come up with some individual graphs for each one of these variables. Individual graphs, starting with the GDP. 
y variables right now um Okay, in so I said if you want to graph them, you go to quick. Right? We just want to graph these variables as they are. You go to quick, then you go to graph. Right, graph. Then when you are here, you just click OK. Then it gives you some options here. You go to the last option under details. We want multiple graphs. We want each variable to appear in its own, in its own graph. So multiple graphs, then click OK. And I'm sure this is the diagram that we came up with. Now tell me, given what we've discussed, the first variable, is it stationary or non-stationary? What is the answer? It is non-stationary. Non-stationary? Uh, that is over true. Time. Yes. It's mean and variance are increasing over time. The second one is also non-stationary. The third one is non-stationary. The fourth one is non-stationary. What about the fifth one? Is it non-stationary or stationary? Stationary. If this one can be stationary or non-stationary. It depends. We would, we would verify by using the formal methods whether this variable is stationary or non-stationary. Right? Because if you look at it, you can see that there appears to be an upward trend here. And there also appears to be a downward trend there. Same applies with this one. There is an upward trend and a downward trend, right? So depending on the strengths of these two trends, one up and one down, depending on their strengths, the variables may be non-stationary, right? Or they may be stationary. It depends, okay? So we, are, we, we don't have a conclusive answer about the stationarity of these variables by merely looking at these two, uh, these two graphs. Now, having said that, now let's, let's try to do the formal test now. Let's try to do the formal test. The formal test. Let's start with the GDP. So what you do is you open the GDP variable. You open it, you click on it, and you open it. These are the what the observations of the GDP variable over time, right? And the while we were in this window, we are now testing. We want to do the augment, the Dickey Fuller test, right? The Dickey Fuller test. That's what we want to do. While you are in this window, you go to view. Then it, all this information comes up. Then you go to unit root test. And the the unit root test that we want is the standard unit root test. We are not going to talk about the breakpoint unit root test or the seasonal unit root test, but we are using the standard unit root test. So that's what we want to use. So you click that. So if you click that, I'm sure you can see where we are. The default test that is there is the augmented Dickey Fuller test. But that is not what we want. We want the Dickey Fuller test, which is the second one. So we click on the Dickey Fuller test. It's called the Dickey Fuller GLS ERIS. 
uh, equation. Now, uh, I think I tried to explain the fact that when using the Dickey Fuller test, even though we specify the three Dickey Fuller test equations, one equation which did not have a constant and trend, and another equation which had a constant, and a third one with a constant and trend. Even though we, we specified those three equations in theory, in practice, when using the Dickey Fuller test equation, you can only do the test with an equation with a constant, that is the intercept, and an equation with a, an intercept and the trend with a constant and trend. So what we are calling intercept is the constant. So you can only conduct the Dickey Fuller test by using an equation with intercept and an equation with the intercept and the trend. You cannot test, test do the test at none. That is why the none is not highlighted. You cannot use it, right? So this is how you conduct the test. Then you can also do the test in levels. That is in the state in which you collected the data. That is what we call the levels. If you have collected your GDP data, your inflation data, your PCE data, dividend data, in that state in which it is, if you do your test, you are doing the test in the levels. You haven't transformed the, the data in any way. You are doing the test in levels. And you can also do the test in first differences. You can also do the test in first differences. So if you do the test in first differences, it means you have transformed the data from its original state to first differences. For example, in what we, we did this in our lecture, we said if you have the variable yt, the variable yt, right? This is the variable in levels. This is what I'm calling levels, the variable in levels. Then uh, you can also first difference this variable by subtracting the previous year's value. So the first difference of this variable, which is referred to in, in what we are going to do in EVUs is dyt, dyt. If you write your variable like this, it means you are finding the first difference of yt. And the first difference of yt is given by yt minus yt minus 1. yt minus 1. Where t and t minus 1 are subscripts, right? So the first difference of yt is given by yt minus yt minus 1. So you do this for all the successive observations. For the 2024 observation and 2023 observation, you find the difference between them. For the 2023 observation and 2022 observation, you also find a difference between them. The 2022 observation and 2021 observation, you also find a difference between them using the very same formula that we are using here. So this is how you first difference a variable. Then to get the second difference, which is written like this, the second difference is written as D2YT, D2YT, YT. It means, you are differencing the first difference, right? You are you are you are differencing this first difference again, differencing it, differencing the first difference. Because when you first difference your variables, you get the observations for all the relevant years, right? And you may you you may lose the observation for the first year in your data set because you are looking at differences, right? So that is what I've, so the second difference, you are differencing the first difference. So in other words, this is what we're saying. 
you find the first difference you find the difference of the first difference you find the difference of the first difference like this yt right so d this y with the d squared uh, yt right we get it from there was we are finding the first difference of the first difference of the variable yt so that's what we mean by this second difference here this one second difference you are differencing a variable that was first that that, that was differenced earlier that that we difference right so you are differencing a first difference variable i hope i'm making myself clear if not you can always ask where you are not understanding so that's the explanation i wanted to give before we look at uh, this test now if you look at this you can see that underlag length it is automatic selection and the Schwarz information criterion is suggested for you uh, you may if you click the down arrow you can see there is also the akaike information criterion there is this one the hana and queen criterion then there is also the modified archaic inf archaic information criterion and the modified uh, Schwarz criterion and the modified Anna and Queen. So all these are the automatic selections that you can use. And uh, normally people experiment with these other criteria if they fail to get a result that makes sense from the first test they did. Right? That's when they can experiment with other ones. But normal practice is for you to go with the default criterion that has been selected for you. You go with the default criterion. So what we are going to do here, we are going to test the unit root test for the variable GDP in the levels using a model with an intercept. Right. This is what is described by what we are seeing in this uh, window here. So we are going to test the unit root for GDP in levels that is using the data that we collected as it is without manipulating it or transforming it in any way. So using the model with intercept. So if you click OK, you will get your test results. And we are mainly interested in this part of the results, the first part of the results. The now hypothesis is given as GDP as a unit root. In other words, we are saying GDP is non-stationary. That is what that hypothesis is telling us. GDP as a unit root or GDP is non-stationary. And the automatic lag that was selected is a one. And the maximum lag chosen is eight from this test that we, we are seeing. Then look at uh, the T-statistic. The T-statistic for this test is 0 0.5, right? And the, in the explanation that I gave earlier, I said that if the calculated T-statistic is more negative than the critical values, and the critical values are the ones that are given here. These are the critical values. These are the critical values. I said if the calculated T statistic is more negative than the critical values, then the variable is stationary. But in this case, the calculated T statistic is actually on the positive side, which means that this variable is a unit root. That is the conclusion that we come to. It is a unit root which means it needs to be differenced for it to become stationary. It is a unit root. I hope you are getting my explanation. Then uh, let's do the test again. 
right? You go to view once again, unit root standard. We are not changing anything, but we are still doing the testing levels, but using a model with the trend and intercept. So you click trend and intercept, right? Then you click OK for your test, right? The, these results are slightly different from the ones that we just saw. The now hypothesis is still GDP as a unit root. The lag length chosen is zero, maximum lag eight. Then going by the explanation I gave earlier, I said, if the calculated T statistic, this calculated T statistic, I hope you are seeing what I'm calling the calculated T statistic, this one, if it is more negative than the critical values, these are the critical values. If it is more negative than the critical values, then the variable is stationary. So that's how you can decide whether the variable is stationary or not. But if you look at our 1.4, it's actually more positive than these critical values. Because if it is more negative, then the test, this T statistic is supposed to have a bigger negative number than these ones here, right? Than the critical values. That's when we say it's more negative. It should have a bigger negative number for it to be more negative than the critical values. So the fact that the calculated T statistic is more positive than the what? the critical values means that the variable is non-stationary. The variable is non-stationary, okay? So this test, the, this test we are using, the Dickey-Fuller test in statistic, we have to judge it by using the calculated T statistic and the critical values, right? And depending on whether the calculated statistic lies between 5% and 10%. If it lies between 5% and 10%, then we say the variable is stationary at 10%. If the calculated statistic lies between 1% and 5%, then we say it is stationary at 5%. If the calculated T is less than, is less than the what? the 1%, then we say it's stationary at 1% level. I hope that is sticking. All right. So you don't have the probability values when you are using the Dickey Fuller oh, test okay. equation. You don't have the probability values, but you can infer the probabilities by using a, the points where or the gaps where you calculated T statistic is falling. Yes, you can go ahead with your question and speak up, please. Uh, Prof. Sunde, yes. I just want to, to verify what I understand. Um, so is the T statistic, right? Uh, the yes. negative 3.7. So it is, is it um, less than 5%. Right, or less than one percent, for example, which is yeah. Um, uh, it is no, no, no. Is that what? If it is less than three when? negative three point seven seven. Mm -hmm. If it is less than negative three point seven seven, then the variable is stationary at one percent level. Okay. If it is falling okay. between three point seven seven and three point one nine. Then we say it's stationary at five percent, and it is for if it is falling between three point one nine and two point eight nine, then it's stationary in level at ten percent. Are you getting it? So if it's stationary. Sorry, if it's falling between, let's say, 1.43 and 3.77, the stationary is uh, uh, 1.43 is the calculated test statistic. Yeah, I know it's separate. I'm trying, to, yeah, I'm trying to get a trend here so I can remember yes. it. 
Yeah. You are saying? I don't know. I understand that you are saying here, yeah, you are doing a comparison and saying that. We are comparing this statistic with the mm -hmm. values, this one. Okay. So I'm saying if this statistic was, say, 3.8, negative 3.8, this one. If it was mm -hmm. negative 3.8, 3 point, negative 3.8, then it's more negative than the critical value at 1%. Okay. Which means okay. we say the variable is stationary at 1%. If it falls between 3.77 and 3.19, if the calculated T statistic falls between 3.77 and 3.19, then we say the variable is stationary at 5%. If it is falling between 3.19 and 2.89, then we say it's stationary in levels at 10% level. So going by the figure that we have here, the figure that we have of 1.4437 is actually greater than all these critical values. It's greater than all these critical values, which means the variable is non-stationary, right? It's greater than all this, so the variable is non-stationary. If 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 this calculated t statistic was more negative than all these critical values, then we say the variable is stationary at one percent level. I hope you are you are getting it. I'm sure you will get it. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, so that's the conclusion. Now we have found that our variable is non-stationary in levels using the model with constant and the model with constant and trend. It's non-stationary in levels. So the next thing that we have to do is to repeat the test in first differences. We difference the variable once and see what happens. So this is what we do. You go back to view unit root test standard Go back to that. Now we are changing things. We are moving from level to first difference. Remember, I said the level refers to the original state in which you collected the data. Those GDP figures that you get from the Namibia statistical agents, the figures as they are, are the variable in level. That is the level of the variable. Then the first difference, you are transforming the variable. So we are going to move to first difference now. And we are going to repeat these two tests using a model with an intercept and a model with a trend and intercept. So we are going to repeat the test and see what the difference is. So let's do the test in first difference using the model with intercept. Click OK. This is what you get. And you are interested in this part once again. And as you can see, we now have we now have a what? A, the variable, we are now saying the first difference of GDP as a unit root. The first difference of GDP as a unit root, right? So that's our now hypothesis. And the, let's look at the, our calculated T statistic. This is the calculated T statistic, right? is more negative than all these critical values, meaning that the first difference of GDP is stationary, is now stationary, at what percentage, at what level of significance? At what level of significance is our variable stationary? Sorry, Prof. Is Say it not non-stationary? Yes. Is it stationary at what level? Is it not non-stationary, sir, because it is more negative than all the critical values? 
I said if we, the variable is more negative, if the test statistic is more negative, then the variable is stationary. So my question is, the variable is stationary at what level of significance? First level, I think. Yeah? Yeah, you must get this right because these are the very things that I will be asking you to do. This test is more complicated than the other two tests that we are going to discuss. Because the other two tests have probability values, but this one does not have a probability value to guide you which means you have to use your what? Your knowledge, with the knowledge that I'm giving you, you have to use that. I said, if the calculated T statistic is more negative than the critical value at 1%, what did I say? Because minus 4.4 .4 is more negative than the critical value at 1%, which is two minus 2.6. I said the variable is stationary. At what level of significance? At what level of significance? At 1%. Yeah, at 1%. At first difference. It was it's more negative than the 1% level of significance, which means it's stationary at one percent so we are saying the first difference of gdp is stationary at one percent level of significance because minus 4.4 .4 is more negative than minus 2.6 which is the one percent level of significance critical value right and let me repeat what i said earlier was from was the other thing that I encourage you, please, if I ask some questions, you must participate, try to answer the questions. It doesn't matter whether you answer the question correctly or wrongly. It doesn't matter because we are here to learn. So if you give a wrong answer, no one will laugh, laugh at you. I will not allow that to happen. So I, I, I encourage participation because I am encouraged to give better explanations if you are participating. If you are not I become demoralized. I'm a human being. I become demoralized. So try to participate. It's very important. All right. But don't just <laughs> keep the answer in your mouth. You say it out. That's what I'm saying. All right. So let's... <laughs> yeah. So let me repeat the explanation. I've said the Dickey Fuller test equation is the only one that does not have probability values. So you have to make your decision by using the information that you are given here. So first, when we did the first test in levels, we were testing that GDP is a unit root and it was not first difference in the first two tests that we did. It was not first difference. And we found that in both occasions, the values that we get of the test were greater than the critical values, these critical values, they were greater than the critical values. And we said the variable is non-stationary. And I went on to explain that if the T statistic that we had found was more negative than the critical values, then we would say that the variable is stationary in levels. And I said that I, I, I then went on to compare, I then went on to compare uh, this. Where I said if the calculated T value is more negative or less than 2.6, uh, which is the critical value at 1%, if it is more negative, then we say the variable is stationary at 1%. And I said if the calculated T statistic lies between the 5% and 1% critical values, lies between the 5% and 1% critical values, these two, then we say the variable is stationary at 5% level of significance. 
And if the variable is calculated T statistic lies between the 5% and 10%, which is 5% this one and 10% this one, then we say the variable is stationary at the 10% level of significance, right? So that's the explanation I gave. And given that explanation, then we then say, it, let's look at the figure that we have here, right? Which is more negative than all these levels of significance. It's more negative than all these levels of significance, which means it's significant at 1%, because the lowest level of significance that we have is 1%. So if the calculated T statistic is more negative than all the significance levels, it means it's significant at 1%. And if it lies between 1% and 5%, it's significant at 5%. If it lies between 5% and 10%, then it's significant at 10%. Right, so this is the conclusion we get to. The variable, the first difference of GDP is a unit root, right? So we accept the now hypothesis after first differencing the variable. We accept the null hypothesis. Now let's let's do the test again using the constant and trend. You go to view unit root test, view unit root test, trend and intercept, first difference. So we are doing the test at first difference. Now using the model with the trend and intercept, then click OK. Now look at, the first part, once again, the now hypothesis is the first difference of GDP is a unit root or is it stationary, is, is, is non-stationary. The first difference of GDP is a unit root, is a unit root, meaning it's non-stationary. I hope I've been explaining correctly, because no, nobody corrected me. The meaning of that hypothesis is that the first difference of GDP has a unit root, meaning that it's non-stationary. And the alternative hypothesis is that the first difference of GDP is stationary, right? So let me uh, let me put our hypothesis here, H0. Uh, we are saying uh, the first difference GDP is non-stationary, is non-stationary. That's what we are saying. The first difference of GDP is non-stationary, or the first difference of GDP is a unit root. It's one and the same thing, right? So which means the alternative hypothesis is saying that the first difference of GDP is stationary. So in making our decision, let's look at this. Can you tell me? Can you can you please tell me? Sorry, sorry Professor. Yes. Well, I understand now, but I just you want to verify. I know I want to I want to verify. Are you uh, correcting yourself over this time now? Were you making a mistake when you were saying that? GDP has a unit root and it is stationary. Are you correcting yourself now because... Uh, uh -uh. I'm hearing something uh, different uh, now. Yeah, No, no, the, the, the interpretation... The interpretation that we did in the previous test, where the test statistic was more negative than all the critical values. We say the GDP is stationary. That is what we said, mm -hmm. which means we reject the now hypothesis and accept the alternative. That is what we did. So there is nothing wrong with the conclusion that we came to when we looked at the previous test that we just looked at. There is nothing wrong. Because our conclusion was that the first difference of GDP is stationary. But in those states, GDP was also in the beginning, it has a unit root. No, the, the very first the two tests. The unit root and the stationary and the non-stationary. Wait, uh, maybe uh, what this means is we have to start over again. No, sir. 
Yeah. <laughs> Wait. Uh, okay, Lo looking at these results, what is our conclusion? The first difference um, between GT. I'm saying that yeah, it, 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 the T statistic is now more negative or what? More negative than. So is GDP stationary or non stationary? The first difference of GDP is it stationary or non stationary? So now, with the notes that I have, I don't know, it says that it's non stationary because it's more negative. Let me just read quickly or whatever. Uh -uh. If it is more negative, it is, it's stationary. It's more, yeah, it's more negative. It's stationary. In the critical value, the variance is stationary. It's stationary, yes. If it is more positive, is if it is on the positive side, then it's non-stationary. So in this case, it's more negative, meaning that it's stationary. It's now stationary. Okay. okay so okay. the first test we did, it was non-stationary. But after first differencing, the variable has become stationary. Now let let me just quickly repeat what we've done so done so far, because you need to understand this. Otherwise, eh, this will will mess up your life. Because we are going to be using this unit root test in all the other chapters that we are going to be doing. So you need to understand this very very clearly. So let me do what I've done from scratch, starting with. Uh, starting with the, the levels, I'm going back to the levels. Right, this is what we did. Uh, testing uh, the unit root for GDP in levels using a model with intercept. This is what we did. We clicked OK, and these are the results. Look at the now hypothesis GDP as a unit root. It means GDP is non stationary. And the alternative hypothesis is GDP is stationary. And we say it 0. 5.4 is greater than all these critical values, which means GDP is non-stationary. This means GDP is non-stationary, right? So in this case, GDP is non-stationary because the calculated T value is greater than all these critical values. So the calculated T, calculated T value is greater than the critical values of T, the critical values of T, right? It's greater than the critical values of T, right? So this means a GDP is non-stationary. That's the conclusion we come to. So GDP uh, is, uh, is non-stationary. So that's the conclusion we came to because the calculated T value is greater than all the critical values. Then we went on to do the test with the constant and the trend, right? The same test with the constant and trend. So in levels, now with the constant and trend, which is trend and intercept, we did the same test. And this is what we found. We found that the calculated T value is greater than all the critical values, right? But the more negative a value is, the smaller it is. So, this calculated T, 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 T statistic is actually greater than all these critical values. And our conclusion was also consistent with what we found initially that GDP is non-stationary. That is our conclusion. Once again, GDP is non-stationary. So this doesn't change. Right, having done that, we went a step further and repeated the test in the first differences using a model with the intercept, with the constant only. We repeated the test, and this is the result that we found. Now, the now hypothesis is now the first difference of GDP as a unit root. In other words, the first difference of GDP is non-stationary. Against the alternative that the first difference of GDP is stationary. And now, here, the calculated T statistic is now more negative than the all the critical values, even at one percent, is more negative than the one percent critical value, meaning that our GDP is now stationary. The first difference of GDP is stationary, right? 
So this is what we are saying. So we are saying the first difference of GDP of GDP uh, is stationary because the calculated T test is more negative than the values of the critical values at the different levels of significance is stationary, right? I hope this is making it clearer. So the first difference of GDP is stationary. Now, what is our conclusion with the, okay? Uh, so we have done the test using what? Using constant, right? So let's do the test again using a constant and trend. That is what we did. Using constant and trend, we repeated the test uh, using constant and trend. Click OK. This is what we find. Once again, the now hypothesis is the first difference of GDP as a unit root. In other words, the first difference of GDP is non-stationary. Against the alternative that the first difference of GDP is stationary. And now, the calculated T value, which I've highlighted, is more negative than all these critical values, which means the first difference of GDP is stationary at 1% level of significance, because this minus 4.77 is more negative than the 1% critical value of minus 3.77, which means our variable first difference of GDP is stationary is now stationary, right? So what is the conclusion that we come to with regards to the GDP variable? <clears throat> we have found that GDP, this, I, I'm now summarizing, I'm now summarizing. Uh, summarizing, we have found that uh, GDP, a G D P is non stationary is non stationary in levels in levels but it became stationary stationary after first differencing of the first difference here. So this is the correct terminology, right? GDP is non-stationary in levels. GDP is non-stationary in levels because we found that the calculated T statistics were actually greater than the critical values. And we said GDP is non-stationary in levels because of that. But the after first differencing GDP, uh, GDP became stationary by using both tests with a constant and the constant and trend. So GDP is non-stationary in levels, but it becomes stationary after first differencing. That is the conclusion we come to. Right. I hope this clarifies everything. And like I said, this is the correct terminology that you are supposed to use. All right, uh, we now move to the second variable and we are now moving fast because you now at least have uh, some understanding uh, of what this means. Uh, let's do that. We are now going to the second variable. Um, obviously we are not going to do all the variables. We will just to do all, only three variables. Then the rest you can do on your own, right? So let's do PCE. Let's do PCE. So like I said, you open PCE, you open it, you just double click it to open it. Then you go to view, then you go to unit root test, then you choose standard unit root test. Right, first you do the test in levels using intercept and intercept and trend. Right, and intercept and trend. Right, uh, we are still using the Dickey Fuller test for this one. The next one will be different. Right, uh, I do the test. Please give me the conclusion. 
that you get here. PCE is a unit root. In other words, PCE is, is non-stationary. And the alternative, alternative hypothesis is PCE is stationary. Now, the answer we get is our T statistic is positive. What, are, what is our conclusion? PCE is it stationary or non-stationary in levels? Is PCE stationary or non-stationary in levels? So mm. it is non-stationary. Correct, it's non-stationary. Because the answer that we have got, the T statistic we have got is greater than our critical values. And we said if it is greater than the critical values, the variable is non-stationary. Then we go to the next test. The next test. A unit root, once again, we are doing the test using a model with the trend and intercept. What is it telling us? This is the calculated T statistic, and these are the critical values. So it is still non-stationary at all three levels. Non-stationary, that is very, very correct, non-stationary. Then we go to the, the next test. Now in the first difference, because we found that using the two tests, the variable is non-stationary. So the next thing you do is to first difference the variable. Then you repeat the test with the model with an intercept. Now, this is the calculated T statistic. Compare it with the critical values. What is your conclusion? So now it is stationary because the um, T statistic is more negative than all three. Correct. So it's stationary at what level of significance? At all three levels, sir. Yes. At one percent, five percent, and ten percent. Right. If, if it is stationary, if it, if it is significant at all three levels, you go with the lowest, one percent. Okay. Yes. So is the stationary at one percent? You must get that right because this is critical. You need to know this because this is like I I think I explained in the previous. In the previous lecture, that this is one of the most important chapters that you are going to do because it clarifies many things that have been wrong with our econometrics. All right, so it's stationary. The first difference of PCE is stationary at 1% level of significance. Then let's do the test with a model with constant and trend, with constant and trend, also in first differences. Click that. This is our calculated T value. Give me the correct conclusion. The first difference of PCE is what? Um, it is still stationary, sir, at 1%, at a 1% significance level. Correct. It's, it's stationary at 1% because minus 4.9 is more negative or smaller than the critical value at 1%, which is minus 0.77. So the first difference of PCE is stationary at 1% level of significance. So what is our conclusion with this variable? The conclusion is that PCE is non-stationary in levels, but it becomes stationary after first differencing. In other words, you need to difference this variable once for it to become stationary. And we said, when you need to difference a variable once for it to become stationary, we say it is integrated of order. What did we say? It is integrated of order one. If you need to difference a variable once for it to become stationary, then it is integrated of order one. And if you don't need to difference a variable for it to become stationary, we said it is integrated of order one. 
if you don't need to difference a variable for it to become stationary, it is integrated of order what? Zero. Zero. Order zero, yes. If you need to difference a variable twice for it to become stationary, it is integrated of order two. So you must be able to link what I'm calling the order of integration and the level at which a variable becomes stationary after differencing. You must be able to link those two explanations. So fine. I think this is is been straightforward. You now at least have some idea of what we are talking about. Now we are going to repeat the same test for GDP and PCE. Now using the augmented Dicky Fuller test, we are now using the augmented Dicky Fuller test. And the one advantage of using the augmented Dicky Fuller test, you you open the variable first, so you open the GDP variable. Uh, open the variable, right. Once you are in this variable window, you go to view, then you go to unit root, standard unit root. Then we start from level, start from intercept. Now, under test type, you are now choosing the augmented Dicky Fuller test. You are now choosing the augmented Dicky Fuller test. All the other things don't change them. You only play around. You only play around with this part here. This is where you just play around. Was you do the test in levels. You do the test in levels using a model with intercept, using a model with trend in intercept, using a model without trend in intercept. Then you also do the test in first differences, using the model with intercept, using the model with trend in intercept and a model with no trend in intercept. So you play around here. You ignore all the other information once you have chosen the method that you want to use. So let's do this test. Let's do this test. So augmented Dick Fuller test in levels using the model with intercept. Click OK. Right. I want you to base your conclusion to ignore ignore the probability value. I want you to base your conclusion on the t-test which we have done. What is your conclusion with this variable using the augmented Dicky Fuller test? It is non-stationary, sir. Correct. It's non-stationary. That is correct. And if the probability value is greater than five percent, the variable is non-stationary. Get me right. If the probability value is greater than 5%, the variable is non-stationary. And you can use the T statistic in the same way we have used it for the Dicky Fuller test equation to make your decision. So you can either use the T statistic or the Dicky Fuller test equation. The result you get, because here you are saying what? The variable is non-stationary. That is true. The variable is also non-stationary using the probability value. Because the probability value you have uh, for this t statistic is greater than five percent, so it's non-stationary. Then uh, we do the test using a model with a uh, trend and intercept, right? Tell me the answer quickly. The variable it is, is non-stationary. So. Non -stationary. Yeah. Using the probability value and the t-statistic is non-station. Let's do the test again using the third model, which does not have constant and trend. That's the one that I picked. Remember, we are doing the test in level. You do the three tests in level, repeat the three tests in the first difference, right? So the third test in level, this is the result. What is your answer? It's non-stationary. It is non-stationary, yes. Yes. Non-stationary boys, the probability value greater than five percent, and the t statistic is greater than the critical values. So the moment you see the t statistic being greater than the critical values, you must know the variable is non-stationary. Right, done with that. So let's go to let's go to the, the test in first differences. So the three tests corroborate each other that 
the variable GDP is non-stationary in levels. That is the conclusion we've come up with by doing those three tests in levels. So the variable is non-stationary in levels by using those three models. Now let's do the test in the first differences, the three tests in first differences. So you pick first differences under test for unit root in first differences. Then we are doing the test using these three models. So we do the first test. What is it telling us? Using the T statistic is more negative than the critical values, which means this variable is now stationary. The first difference of GDP is stationary. It is stationary at 1% level of significance. Same applies if you look at this probability value, it's less than 1%, because 1% is 0 0.01. 0 0.01 is 1%, but here you have 0 0.0012, which is less than 1%, which means it's significant at the 1% level of significance. So the variable, the first difference of GDP is stationary at the 1% level of significance. So let's repeat the test using a model with trend and intercept. Right, give me the answer, please. Um, sir, it is Adi. now stationary. Um, at um, uh, I think five percent significance level. Zero. You must get this right. We did this exercise. It's stationary. At what percentage? At one percent. Yeah. Yes. Zero point one is ten percent. Zero point zero one is one percent. Zero point zero zero one is less than one percent. Can you see that? So it's significant at what percentage? It's significant at what level of significance? This number here. Is it greater than this one or less than this number? 0 0.01. 0 0.01 and 0 0.0043. Which, which number is bigger? 0 0.010. 0 .0. And 0 0.0043. Which one is bigger between these two? Zero point zero one. This is bigger. So, what is the level of significance there? One percent. Can't you see that? Because if you are saying this number is smaller than this one, then it means this number is smaller than one percent. If it is smaller than 1%, then we are saying the first difference of GDP is significant at 1% level of significance. You must get this right, please. Because I explained this, even in the first lecture, I explained these percentages. So you must get this right. You must get this right. And given the explanations that I'm giving now, I would definitely ask some questions which require you to make use of these things. Because my voice cannot go to waste. All right, so we've done the test 
by using constant and linear trend. Now let's do the test once again. So we are saying using the T statistic, the method we used using the Dickey Fuller test, you conclude that the first difference of GDP is stationary, is stationary after first differencing, then here it's significant at 1% using the probability factor. So let's do the test using uh, using a, a model without constant and without trend. This is the this is it. Now this is a good. Uh, who can tell me the correct answer? Who can tell me the correct answer? It's stationary at five percent. Yes, correct. That is very correct. It's stationary at five percent because zero point zero three one lies between lies between what e, lies between e, one percent and five percent and five percent. And I said if he. This number lies between 1% and 5%, then it means if the probability lies between 1% and 5%, then what it means is that uh, the variable is stationary at 5% level. You use the the, 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 uh, the the upper the upper number or the higher number. It's stationary at 5%. So that is how you have come up with your decision, is because this probability value lies between 1% and 5%. Now, if you use this test statistic 2.16 lies between the critical values of 2.6 is greater than 2.16 and 1.95 is smaller than 2.16. So it lies between 1% and 5%, which means you are saying your GDP is stationary, your first difference of GDP is stationary at the 5% level of significance because your calculated T value lies between the five percent and the one percent critical values. I, I I hope that is making everything clear. All right. So we are done with this. Now let's do one more. Uh, no. I think you you have understood this one. There's no need for me to go for another variable. Let me leave it at that. So let's go to the last method, the Phillips Perron test. And once again, the decision rules are the same, and the, the Phillips Perron also has a, a probability which you can use to make your decision. To make your decision. So let's do the Phillips Perron test. We open GDP once, once again. Open GDP once again. E, go to unit root standard. None. Then we start the test in levels. Then we are choosing Phillips Peron. That's the third method we did. Phillips Peron test, PP test. And e, you don't change anything on this side. Even this, don't change anything. You just leave it as it is. You just leave it as it is. Right, so you don't change anything. So let's do the test in level using the three tests. This one is three tests as well. So let's do that. You do the test in level. Tell me your conclusion quickly. You now know this. What is your conclusion? The variable is non-stationary. Yes, the variable is non-stationary, true. So let's do the next test. Uh, you don't change it. You are still doing the test in levels. 
but using a model with trend and intercept. What is your conclusion given what you have here? The variable is non stationary. Non stationary, correct. So using the probability value is greater than the probability value is greater than five percent or greater than ten percent. So it's non stationary, most the probability value is greater. Or using this calculated T is bigger than all these critical values. So it's done stationary, correct. So let's do the test with the last one, with the last model, with no constant and no trend. Click OK. What is the answer? Non stationary. Non stationary, once again. So if you do the test for all these three tests that we have done for GDP, using the Dickey Fuller test, using the augmented Dickey Fuller test and the Phillips Perron test, the three tests seem to be confirming the fact that the variable GDP is non stationary in levels. So all the three tests are confirming that GDP is non-stationary in levels. So let's repeat this test using the Phillips Perron test in first differences. First difference using the first model with the intercept. What is your answer? And I want you to use the probabilities correctly. Stationary. Actually stationary. At what level of significance? One percent. Correct. So you must be able to tell the correct story that the first difference of GDP is stationary at one percent level of significance using the calculated T value, which is more negative than all these critical values, and using the probability, this probability is also smaller than 1%, which means the variable first difference of GDP is stationary at 1% level of significance. So let's repeat the test. with the trend and intercept. First difference, trend and intercept. Okay. What is your answer? What is your conclusion? So it is non-stationary at a 1% significance level. Non-stationary. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I think stationary because it's more negative. Yes, it's stationary. Oh. It's stationary. And it's, it's more negative than any, if you, even if you use the probability, it's telling, it's telling you the same story. So whether you use the T value or the probability value, the result that you get is the same. They don't uh, contradict each other. Okay, so that's it. So let's repeat the test with the third test. It's telling us that, yeah, this one it makes you think a bit. Give me the answer, the correct one. So I think this one is stationary at a 5% significance level. Stationary at 5% significance level, correct? Because 1.96 lies between 1.95 and 2.6, so it's significant at 5% level of significance. Same applies if you look at 0 0.04, it's below 5% and it's between 1% and 5% level. So the probability is also giving you the same information. So that is correct. So from the look of things, 
you now understand how you make your decision using this. So what is our overall conclusion with the GDP? The overall conclusion is that GDP variable using Dickie Fuller test, augmented Dickie Fuller test, and Philip Peron is non-stationary in levels. But it becomes stationary after first differencing. That is your overall conclusion. It's non-stationary in levels, but it becomes stationary after first differencing. Now, I would urge you to install e-views on your laptops and practice with the other variables that we have left out. Or maybe let's, let's use a variable that we suspect to be stationary. That we suspect to be stationary. Let's use that variable. Let's use what? Inflation. I will go to inflation. Uh, inflation. I just want to open the series. Uh, the statistics. No. Shit. Okay, this one. So these are the statistics, right? These are the statistics for inflation. Now let's try to do the this test using uh, using the Dickey Fuller test. Let's do this test using the Dickey Fuller test. Uh, let's start with the Dickey Fuller. Uh, we said the Dickey Fuller only has two models, intercept and intercept and trend. So I will do the test, right? Do the test. Tell me the answer. What is this telling us about inflation? I don't need to tell you the answer now. This is inflation in levels. Sir, um, I think it is stationary at a 1% um, significance level. Which means uh, this variable inflation is integrated of order. Is integrated of order what? Zero. Correct. It's stationary in, in levels. Remember the conclusion that we came up with our GDP. We said GDP variable using the three tests is non-stationary in levels, but it became stationary after first differencing, which means it is integrated of order. One. Is that great of order? There's nothing to think there. We differenced it once and it became stationary. So it's integrated of order. order what? One. Order? One. Correct. It's integrated of order one. Because we difference it once for it to become stationary. So GDP, this is the final result we, we got. If you are telling the story, your story must end by you talking about this order of integration. Okay, so done with that. Let's let's go to let's go to the, the variable we are analyzing. Let's use the second test test equation. Right, second test equation. Okay, tell me the answer, please. Inflation is stationary or non-stationary at what level? Inflation is what? Um, is stationary at a 5% significance level. Look carefully. Um, 
at the 10%. Correct. Oh, 10% okay. level. Because it's lying between the 5% and 10% critical values. So you have to be accurate. Be accurate with the, your analysis. So it's 10%. That's it. So the, wh what this means is there is no need for us to repeat the, first, the test in the first differences because the variable is already stationary in levels. So we can't go any further. It means if we were to use this variable in a regression equation, we would have to use it as it is because it will help us produce good results. That is what I was trying to explain at the beginning. That if you have your variables that you want to use in a regression equation, if you find that all the variables that you want to use in your regression equation are integrated of order zero, if all your variables are integrated of order zero, then those variables can be used in a regression equation and you will be able to get some authentic results if your variables are integrated of order zero. But if they are not integrated of order zero, then the results that they give you are called spurious results or nonsensical results, right? So this is a very good candidate uh, to be used in an ordinary least squares regression equation. So then let's go to the second test with the same variable to see if the three tests confirm each other with regards to this variable. Right, let's go to the augmented Dick Fuller test. Augmented Dick Fuller test, you choose augmented Dick Fuller test, then you do the test at intercept using a model with intercept. That's what you get. What is the what is your conclusion? Correct conclusion. Model with the constant. Yeah. You guys, there's nothing to think there. Nothing, nothing to, to, to think. Just tell me the so answer. I think it is stationary at a 10%. Stationary at 10 percent level. That is correct because it's showing there stationary 10%. And this critical value is lying between 5% and 10%. This 2.633 is lying between this and this. So this is stationary. That's what we are saying, stationary at 10%. Then let's look at the next one with the constant and trend. Uh, constant and trend, unit root, standard, a constant and trend. What is it telling you? Just tell me the answer, please. There's no need to waste time by thinking, overthinking here. It's what? It is stationary at 10% significance. It is stationary at 10%, yes. You just look at the probability. Because I said the probability makes life easier in this case. It's different from using the Dickey Fuller test. Because you just go to the probability if it is between 5% and 10%, then it's significant at 10%. What about it? None? It's none. In... Let's see what answer we get. You go to view once again, unit root, and the none. Then you click OK. What is this telling us? What is this telling us? Non -stationary the variable is non-stationary, sir. Right. It's none. We are saying the variable is non-stationary. The variable is non-stationary. So there is a reason why I was writing this here. I did. I wasn't doing that with the other variables. So using the model with a constant, the variable is stationary. It's 10%.
using the model with constant and trend, the variable is stationary at 10%. Using the model with a, a no constant and, and trend, the variable is non-stationary. So your conclusion here is based on what the majority of the tests are saying. So two of the tests are telling you that the variable is, non is stationary, and the one test is telling you the variable is non-stationary. One model is telling you the variable is non-stationary, which means your conclusion is the variable is stationary. That is your conclusion. You go with the majority. If two of the tests were saying the variable is non-stationary, and one was saying the variable is stationary, then you would conclude that the variable is non-stationary. I hope I'm making myself clear, because I will not be able to repeat this again, so get it right. If that is clear, let's, let's proceed. So let's do the third test. Let's do the third test. And the third test that we are going to do, the Phillips Perron, is considered to be more powerful than the augmented Dickey-Fuller test. So we may actually get results that are slightly different from what we got using the augmented Dickey Fuller test. So let's do that using the Phillips Perron and compare the results. And compare the results. Right. So once again, we go to view unit root. We choose Phillips Perron now. Phillips Perron. And then the, the model with intercept. You don't change anything else. You keep everything as it is. Then you click OK. This is our first test. What is it telling us about this variable? Inflation is stationary, non stationary. Non stationary, sir. Non stationary. Mm -hmm. Right, then let's repeat the test. Uh, what is it telling us? Uh, this is constant and trend. And trend. It's also non-stationary. I hope you are seeing what I'm seeing. Then he, he, it's none. Let's see what's happening. It's none. It's none. What is it telling us? Mm. It's none. It's none. What is it telling us? What is the answer? It's non stationary. Non stationary, sir. Right. So, this is the Phillips Perron PP. Then, using the augmented Dickey Fuller test, I'm, I'm going to summarize that information that we had earlier. Using the augmented Dickey Fuller test, right, we had the, this is the PP, and this, the augmented Dickey Fuller test, we had the, the model with the constant. We said it was, stationary it was stationary the model with the constant and the trend was also stationary it was also stationary then the model at none at none was also was the non-stationary this was non-stationary right e using the Dickey fuller test the one which we said is some issues of autocorrelation, we found that the variable was stationary. If you still remember the variable was stationary. Okay. So the two key tests that you are supposed to perform for your mini thesis in the second semester are these two tests, the Phillips Perron and the augmented Dickey Fuller test, right? Uh, you may ignore the Dickey Fuller test because of the problem that we have actually unearthed in what we have done so far. The Dickey Fuller test has told us that the variable is stationary in levels. But uh, the Phillips Perron 
is telling us that the variable is non-stationary. The augmented decoupler test, there's some conflicting results. Two results are saying it's stationary. The other one is saying it's non-stationary. So using these two tests, the Phillips Heron and augmented decoupler test, you have to come up with your own conclusion about the status of this variable. So you have to count. You have four tests that are telling you that the variable is non-stationary. And how many? And two, which are telling you that the variable is stationary. So what is the majority here? The majority is that the variable is non-stationary in levels. Please get this information clearly because I may not have an opportunity to repeat it since we have a lot of ground to cover going forward. So get this explanation right. In this case, in what you are going to do in the second semester, I'm advising you that you ignore the Dickey Fuller test. You only use the Phillips Peron test and the augmented Dickey Fuller test. Then if you do your test like we have done here using the three models, constant, constant, and trend, and it's none, you look at both models, the Philip Peroni and the augmented Dickey Fuller, and the, you go with the majority. So the majority of these tests are telling us that the variable is non stationary. And the minority is telling us that the variable is stationary, which means your overall conclusion should be that the variable is non stationary which means it needs to be differenced for it to become stationary. So let's do that using these two tests and see what happens. If we difference it, then how do things change? If we difference it, how do things change? Right, so let's do it. In unit root standard. So first difference now, we are first, Differencing it, and we are using the augmented Dickey Fuller test first. First difference using the augmented Dickey Fuller test. Click OK. This is what you get. What is it? What is it telling us now? The variable is now stationary. The first difference of inflation is stationary at one percent. Then you go to the next. Next test with the trend and constant. The variable is stationary, is now stationary at the 5% level of significance. 5% level of significance because 0 0.01, is it 5%? It's 1%. Was this 0 0.01? So it's 1% level of significance. It's 1% level of significance. Can you see that it's 1% because this is 0 0.01, which is 1%. Yes. So it's stationary at 1%. Then we go to the next test. It's also stationary at 1%. So the three tests are now unambiguously confirming each other, right? So the variable inflation becomes stationary after first differencing, right? Then he, using the augmented Dickey-Fuller test, let's do it using the Phillips Peron test and see what we get. Unit root standard using the Phillips Peron test. The Phillips Peron is the one that was unambiguous in saying that the variable is non-stationary in levels, was all the three tests under Phillips Peron. He, is non stationary levels. So let's do the test in the first differences using the intercept. Can you see that? The first difference of inflation is stationary at 1% level of significance. Let's do the second test. The first difference. The, the, the inf first difference of inflation is stationary at the 5% level of significance, was 0 
one, two, that is between one percent and five percent. So it's now five percent. Even if you take the critical value, sorry, the calculated t statistic, it lies between five percent and one percent, which means it's significant at five percent. So it's stationary at five percent level of significance. Then in the last test, unit root standard at none. It's stationary at 1% level of significance. So, when you are doing your own research, you may also reach a stage where you find that your results are conflicting. And like I said, I advise you to use the augmented Dickey Fuller test and the Philip Perron test. And your conclusion must be guided by what the majority of the tests are saying. If the majority are saying the variable is non-stationary, then the, the variable is non-stationary. If the majority are saying the variable is stationary, then the variable is stationary. That is how you make your decision. So, as you can see, since our conclusion using the Philip Perron and the augmented Dick Fuller test was that the variable was non-stationary after going the majority, after first differencing all the three tests using the two methods are uh, uh, unanimous in saying that the variable is, so the first difference of the variable is stationary. So that is what we have found. Uh, so with that, I think we have come to the end, but there is still some things that I want to share with you before you, you go, because I may not, I may forget some of these things. Um, all right. Um, in economics, remember I've said you can collect data on GDP, exports, imports, money supply, exchange rates, inflation, and so on and so forth. Personal disposable income, personal consumption expenditure, and all those other things that we've been looking at. So you can collect data on all those variables. And most of the variables that whose data we collect have huge what huge figures. For example, if it is GDP, the figures could be in billions of dollars. If it is consumption, it could be in billions of dollars as well. If it is foreign direct investment, it's in billions of dollars. If it is exports, imports, billions of dollars, and so on and so forth. So in economics, we usually transform the variables that are that big to logarithms. We transform the variables to logarithms. This is the last thing that we are doing today. We transform the variables to logarithms. So in what we are going to be doing is to transform the variable GDP to logarithms, you need to give it a new name. So the new name will be LN GDP, LN GDP. The initial variable is just GDP. This is the initial variable GDP. So to transform the variable to natural logarithms, you just add an LN before GDP, so it's LN GDP. And the, in if use, this is how you generate, this is how you generate the, the, the natural log of GDP. It's the, the formula is log, log, uh, log what? Log GDP, where GDP is in brackets, where GDP is in brackets. So this is how you generate your log of GDP, then for your log of PCE, log of L and PCE, PCE, I'm using the variables that we used previously. It will be log uh, PCE, PCE, log PCE. And for the other one we had is what, lean PDI, PDI, personal disposable income. 
PDI. So this is the name that you are giving your variable. And the, this is the formula you use to generate this new variable you are trying to generate. So PDI, PDI. So it, it, this is how you transform your variables. And if you transform your variables to natural logs, it, there are some things that you are trying to resolve by doing that. Your model may not have problem of heteroscedasticity if you use variables that are logged. So by logging your variables, you are actually in a way resolving for the problem of heteroscedasticity. So if you have variables that have positive numbers that are big, all those variables need to be logged. And by doing that, you are resolving the problem of heteroscedasticity. And I'm sure we are going to make use of this in our next tutorial session, which will be next week, but one. And let me emphasize the fact that our theory lectures are face-to-face -face and the tutorials are online. That is what I said in our very first lecture, and I'm repeating it now. So next time we are not going to have to schedule another lecture over the weekend. I don't want that. And the, if you are not sure about the, the time of the lecture, I'm always available. You can always contact me to verify if the lecture is face-to-face -face or in line well before time, right? So our next lecture on Monday is face-to-face. -face. Then our following lecture is online. That is how we are going to be doing right up to the end of the semester. That is not going to change. So this lecture that we've done, I've recorded it. I'm going to upload it in my private YouTube channel. You can always access it anytime. So see you on Monday. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. All right.